She's an Emmy-nominated director and producer. This book, Horse Barbie, is gonna land at the end of the month, and you're gonna see it everywhere. Okay, you're gonna see major features in the New York Times and the Vanity, in Vanity Fair. Please, the lights down just a little bit on us. Um, it is going to be, in my prediction, an international bestseller is gonna be absolutely a phenomenon. Um, so we're incredibly honored to have Gina with us before she comes out. One other thing is, Gina's been involved in the Summit community since 2010, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But this community has been a, an essential part of her journey, and please give me an incredible warm welcome for my friend Gina Rosero. Hello. <laughs> Look, I got cute for you guys, my high heels. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are, dear. Um, I have been just diving into this book, like feeling your life, feeling like the smells, the sounds, the fears, the elation. Um, and we don't have too much time together, so we're gonna just dive right in. And we're gonna do this in about eight pictures. Um, so we're gonna start with this picture. And you're gonna tell us what is going on. Look at this beautiful human being looking back at us. Where are you? What are you feeling? What are you, what are you holding down inside? Take us there. I was uh, 21 years old in this picture. You know, it's funny, um, the title of this conversation was called Remarkable Life. But this picture, I felt like I was, there was a mark on my back, you know? There was a mark on who I am. There's a mark on what I could be and, and the fears. So this is, uh, I was 21 years old. I just moved to New York City. This is 2005. This is a, a screenshot of, uh, I was in a John Legend music video called Number One. I was one of the girls. <sighs> whatever I was doing here, whatever I was feeling, I was definitely, one thing I know, there was a lot of fear that's happening here because in 2005, when I moved to New York City, As a fashion model, I had to hide everything about who I am. So I, when I moved to New York City in 2005, I didn't tell my agent. I did, the fashion industry did not know I was transgender because it was not allowed. To be an out and proud trans woman is not allowed. So I made the decision to not share that part of who I am. And in this music video, what's crazy, and you could watch this on YouTube now, this is so, I think we talked about like the, the madness of, of, of this music video because when John Legend was, what, on, on my part when I was in, in this scene, John Legend was singing. Now who is she? What's her name? You don't need to know about everything. Talking about mad, cosmic, full circle craziness. And you're dancing seductively behind him. Yes. <laughs> and him singing that to me with him not knowing, obviously, that I'm trans. And there's a scene in, in, in this picture where I think that what happened in the scene bef before the shot, there was a shadow and there was a, there was a scene where I flipped my hair back. Beautiful silhouette. And I remember doing that shot so fucking worried because if I flip my hair back, what if they see my Adam's apple? What if the camera sees something? And I could be done, you know, if they find that out because every single trans fashion model that came before me, it's littered with stories that they're fashion models, but the moment they got outed, 
They were thrown into trash, they disappeared, their careers were gone. So in as much as this, if you watch this, the, this music video, it's just, in as much as it was very sexy, it's very sensual, what's going on in my mind was, do not flip the hair because I might get found out. And my career, as someone who was born and raised in the Philippines, moving to New York City to pursue a career in fashion, having to hide everything. And this is the beginning, I was 21 years old, this is the beginning of the life in New York City for eight years, where I was in, the, in an industry that is all about the power of imagery, but I was not being seen. I was a fashion model in New York City, so visible, like I was in the covers of magazines, I run Billboard Times Square, all of it. Can I mention one other thing? Okay. Complex Magazine had just called you and put you in the magazine as one of the 10 most beautiful women in the world. Wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> so that was also part of you know what was happening when I first moved to New York City. I was so visible, but so consciously invisible at the same time. And having to manage all of that for eight years, I almost went crazy. The paranoia of always having to edit every single thing that I have to share to someone. I would go on, I would go on, um, cattle call casting, right? Where it's like thousand models. But be, be, because we would be there for a while and on, on, in my bag, every time I would go to the bathroom, I would have to bring a tampon. Just in case one of the girls asked, do you have a tampon? So I won't get found out. Yeah. Now, all of us have secrets. We have things that we wouldn't want the world to know because they might end something in our work or relationship or at least the way people treat us and here you are your whole life is that secret writing this book it's um it's my way to process what happened it's my way to process and to i guess just to it's true what they say when you write a book, it's all this catharsis and everything, but it was really my way to look back, but more so heal. And how much mental anguish that I have to carry for eight years of my life as a fashion model. And leaving my family, leaving everything behind, and somehow just wanting to pursue a dream. And, but having to do all that um, took its toll in my mental health. To get stolen, my emotional. I almost went crazy. I think I said that, but yeah. Of course. Well, let's go way back then, because um, here's another picture that you can tell us about. This is the alley where I grew up in the Philippines. Um, this tiny little alley where I grew up. This is a whole universe. Our houses, you see the flowers, is just right underneath. We live in this sublevel house. Four by eight, there's four of us. It gets, it, it floods every time it rains. But this little alley was a whole universe. I was, you know, a young kid playing. My family, somehow, I was the youngest um, in our family, but somehow in, in this small, alley, literally this alley where I grew up, it's a whole universe. I'm always outside playing, but also somehow every time I leave this alley, in as much as I had so much love by my, my family, my, my dad, my sisters, my brothers, every time I leave this alley, it's a sense of danger because I would get called all the names you know, as a young trans Filipina femme running around getting, you know, I, I used to sell like this um, sticker rice 
in the Philippines. And every time I would walk around in a neighborhood where they don't know me, but they could figure out that some, some way, somehow the way I walk, they would chase me and throw um, rocks at me, but. <laughs> yeah. um, how, how old were you when you knew that you were a femme? Because that's what you would call it then. Yes. Yes. I was five years old and I clearly remember, I clearly remember walking around our house, always wearing t-shirt on my head or towel, and I would play around like, this is my hair. And every queer person, I mean, even a gay guy could understand like the hair flowing, right? Feeling ourselves. But for me, when I was wearing that, I just, it's not because like, oh, this is my hair. Like I really felt new that I'm a girl. And I told my mom that because at some point my mom kept on saying like, why do you always wear that? And I told my mom, mom, this is my hair, I'm a girl. And your father, who's this macho guy, can we go there shortly? This is a macho man, has a little bit of a hard time with drinking a bit. Um, and in all other ways, you wouldn't expect him to be supportive of this. Um, a young femme, boy, girl in his life. And how, how did he respond? Let me back up a little bit here. So as you've mentioned earlier, I've been part of the summit community. I was on the very first summit at sea, 2011. I moved to New York City in 2005. 2011, being here in the summit at sea, it was the first inclination that I could potentially come out and share my story because this is community that I felt like who could accept me. And um, 2011 was a big year. And then it was also the same year I went to Burning Man, had a hero's dose of acid. <laughs> I found my way somehow. And in that trip at Burning Man, I went crazy, 2011, the temple, the temple theme that year was Temple of Transition. I mean, like, someone's speaking to me, right? But in that trip, the the thing that came back to me was my dad. And in that moment where everything kind of felt like it made sense because this, as you've said, my, I, in, in this book, I, I hope I pictured my dad and I painted the, the character and the fullness of my dad that is very complicated, his drinking problem, violent, but somehow on that trip, I just remembered how, how accepting he is of me how loving he was of me. Unfortunately, he passed away. But in this moment when I felt like it was the first time for me to remember him and he came back to me and I could only imagine what my, my dad was carrying for himself too. He was going through a lot of pain. Um, you know, macho Catholic guy, getting into fights, violent, almost like chased my mom with a knife at one, one day <laughs> because my mom was a breadwinner and my dad was the stay-at-home dad. And there was, in the Philippines, a lot of people leave Philippines to go work abroad. 10% of Filipinos are outside. You see them here, right? When I see them, I, I have to talk to them. I wanna know where they're from. My dad was doing that. And my dad was, uh, was a contract worker in Saudi Arabia, uh, working in a port. And no, at the time, he was contracted to work uh, for two years straight, no coming back to the Philippines. And after six months of his contract, he had to go back home because he felt like he missed his family. And I felt like maybe that's a part of the pain and, and the trauma of my dad feeling like he, he felt, I'd like to think that he felt like he couldn't provide for the family. So somehow I feel that the love and the acceptance of this macho violent guy to his trans daughter, I could only imagine maybe the sensitivity that he was feeling that maybe he was feeling that for me too. That's why he just wanted to accept me. 
Yeah, he did need to come home. Um, okay, so we're going to do these. We're going to do a couple on the quicker side so we can get to some of the later ones in our time. So what is going on here, Gina? <laughs> well, I was, I was 15 years old here. This is... So when I was 15 years old, we, in the Philippines, we have this culture of transgender beauty pageants where, I mean, if you read, it says Fiesta Pansol, Extravaganza 1999. In the Philippines, um, we have this culture of vibrant trans beauty pageant. And usually when we have Catholic fiesta celebration, which is usually like a five day celebration, and usually on the fifth day of the fiesta celebration, which usually falls on a Sunday, the main event is a transgender beauty pageant. <laughs> And usually that pageant is right in front of the, right in front of this pageant is right in front of a church. Because I've lived half of my life in the Philippines, half, half in the United States, Americans would say like, oh, you mean it's, ac it's accepted because it's part of the culture. It's a little bit complicated than that. But certainly I was 15 here, I started joining pageants. I, I have this trans mother named Tiger Lily who saw me at 15 and she told me you should join trans beauty pageant. I was like, of course I'm gonna join trans beauty pageant. On my very first pageant, I won second runner up, best in swimsuit. <laughs> best in swimsuit. <laughs> best in long gown. And I was, I was addicted and I was making so much money. Yeah, that, that was me at 15 years old. And then here we are, this is, Probably right before you moves. Yeah, this is to this is this was called Miss Gay Universe 2000. I won at 17 years old. I won the most prestigious. I'm the one in the middle. Those other two are my uh, pageant sisters. I won the most prestigious beauty pageant in the Philippines at 17, and it just took me to a different trajectory of my life and. But also, little did I know this life that I lived, because at 15, from 15 to 17 years old, I joined every single transgender beauty pageants that you could imagine in the Philippines. Like, this is the most prestigious, but I've joined pageants next to a rice field, next to a mountain, next to a 20,000 Coliseum, a national television. I joined them all, I won them all. So, yeah, this is the most prestigious pageant and little did I know what was to come next after this. Okay, so a little bit of context for those that you just came in. We were hearing about Gina's life um, in the Philippines where she was goddamn famous. Like the winningest, most um, trans pageant, winner of all time kind of felt like it when I, from my understanding. Um, you decide to leave all of this behind because you have the opportunity to become a woman in the United States. And what some of you missed and are just coming in, Gina then went on to become one of the most in-demand models, female models in the United States, being called by Complex Magazine as one of the 10 most beautiful women in the world. And no one knew her secret. Okay, and so bring us to the TED stage. What are you doing at Big TED? <laughs> I think what I just said, like I've been, you know, loving all the big stages. So, <laughs> so after, you know, at the beginning of the picture, after being a model for eight years, having to hide all of that secret, having to maneuver the stories that I tell people, having to edit everything, every single day of my life. <sighs> and it's making you sick too, the secret. Having to hide all of that, something had to give. I, I almost went crazy. You know, I'm not diagnosed, but certainly I was a functioning depressed person because I would be on covers of magazines and I would come home 
thinking that somebody, like a page six editor would call my, my model agent and say, hey, Gina, there's a page six story that, oh, you're a man, you're a boy, right? The gossip pages, because that's what happened to every single trans model that came before me. So after all of that, I realized on my 30th birthday, I cannot do this anymore. I can't continue doing this anymore. As a gift for myself, that I'm gonna enter my, 30, my, my 30th birthday to live my truth. So after years and years of hiding, I decided that if, if I'm going to risk my career and my life, let me do it in the biggest stage that I could think of, you know? Let me come out on a TED stage. <laughs> Who comes out in a TED talk, right? And yeah, and this TED talk changed my life. I mean, it's a moment in, this is 2014, and little did I know, 2014 was the, it unleashed this conversation about trans rights in, in public consciousness, in the zeitgeist, so this, yeah, this TED talk, I don't know what I was thinking, but certainly I knew I couldn't continue anymore. So I gave this TED talk. How did it feel to go from living a secret to living your full bodied self? And once again, fairy in the public eye with it. I mean, that can come with a lot of complications, but what was the shift change in you between the before and the after? You know, it's, it's crazy because I went from super someone hiding a secret to nobody knows who I am and I went completely the other side. Unapologetically trans woman, giving a TED talk, being called by President Obama, State Department to travel the world, to speak about trans rights. I felt like I was having an Angelina Jolie moment, you know? Uh, change of career, I'm gonna speak at the UN, all of that, and I did that. I did all of that. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I did that, right? And then, I felt like I entered a different trap. A different trap of the burden of representation. Because I found myself in the most powerful places at the UN, White House, all of that, State Department, everywhere, as the only trans person in the room and being tasked to represent the whole community. And I said, I can't do this anymore after a couple of years of doing that. And as much as I wanted to obviously represent my community, I just felt something is wrong here. And being the only one in the room, maybe at some point, people would think you're trailblazing, you're doing this thing. But to be the only one in the room, the burden to represent the community. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't continue and I felt like I'm an artist. I want to tell story. And I think that realization of if I'm the only one in the room, maybe when I was younger, I'd be like, look at me trailblazing, look at this bitch, right, doing it. I think it began, I began to question like, what is the system that created why I'm the only one in the room? And I began to question to how do I when people say you, you've opened the door, and I just realized how do I keep that door open? And I told myself, I felt like I was my Angelina Jolie moment, let me do my Tyra Banks moment, and like, let me, let me start a production company, <laughs> and beca become an artist that I am, and tell more stories about trans youth, about their lives all over the world. Well, and some fun things happened though. Um, <laughs> let's let's get to a couple of the fun things before your artist soul got to fully take over. Um, let's see. Well, this one's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen the president laugh like this? <laughs> I mean, we won't talk about the hand at the back, but you know. <laughs> We're having a great time. Let's just say that. 
<laughs> no, I told a joke about Filipino food, and I was making fun of him. And it was, it was, I was, I was speaking at the Democratic National Committee uh, gala, and it's just one of those things. I know I was giving a speech, and I know he was following after me, and it's just one of those things. Like, what do I tell him? <laughs> I just, I, I, I remember telling him some. A couple of days before this um, this uh, event, he was changing different policies about trans rights. So basically, when I saw him backstage, I basically scream at him like, oh, "You kept on changing trans rights. You're like a Twitter feed." <laughs> and started laughing, and thank God somebody captured this. It's frame at my mom's house. That's for sure. All right. <laughs> Giving him jabs. Okay, some other fun stuff went down. What's going on here? <laughs> well, you know. I mean, other than looking hot as shit. In 2019, I was named the very first transgender Asian Pacific Islander Playboy Playmate. <laughs> and it's... It was at the point in my life where I just felt, it, it was crazy how it happened. I mean, a little backstory. It was, this is 2018 when I, um, I was at the point of my career where I felt like, you know what, I've done the TED Talk, I'm doing the thing, blah, blah, blah. But I was just like, you know, really, I think I wanna hone it back to like, I know, and in this book that I wrote, I think we talked about this too, after doing all the advocacy work, and people have known me from the advocacy work, TED Talk, you know, this respectable trans woman, whatever. In this book, when I, when I decided to write this book, I wanted to center and honor the sensuality of the journey. You know, the, 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 the relationship that I have in my femininity and what it means to me to share that with the world. So I got a DM from Playboy and said, <laughs> I got a DM from Playboy. And they said, hey, we've, we know your work. We have this issue that's coming out. So you want to be our first AAPI Playmate? It's like, of course you say yes. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> um, all right. So we've got about 10, a little bit over 10 minutes left. And there's a couple things I want to make sure we talk about. It wasn't always that in a, globally in many indigenous cultures, but definitely in the Philippines, um, that being gender fluid was not looked down upon. In fact, it was elevated. Mm -hmm. So I wanna talk about that. I wanna talk about what's happening here. Um, yeah, this is one of those things. This is an iconic, if you're in fashion and, and advertising, this is one of the most iconic cover and we cr recreated that. And it was, I was the first one on the cover, Harper's Bazaar and um, yeah, in, in my career, it's just like after, you know, obviously coming out and sharing my story, just one thing after the other. And I think the next slide after this, it's, this is an image in pre-colonial Philippines, transgender people, this shaman um, in the Philippines, uh, this is called the Babaylan, which is a gender fluid, spiritual leader in the Philippines, where we are the advisors to the kings and queens in the Philippines. We are the, um, we, we give advice to um, how to carry the, the culture. So I think the point I wanted to share when we talk about the powerful thing here is like, trans people have always existed since the very beginning of time. In most pre-colonial culture, we've always known, my answers have always known, in the Philippines, we don't even have he or she, it's a gender neutral language. And in many cultures all over the world, Philippines is part of this um, language family called Austronesian language family, which is spoken by close to 500 million people with 1200 dialects. And most of those dialects are gender neutral. So this thing called gender binary, what is that? In the Philippine context, um, the introduction of gender binary is a tool of colonization. It's a tool of, because in pre-colonial Philippines, we've had this gender fluidity 
And then in 1521, we were colonized by Spain for 333 years, thus the introduction of patriarchy, Catholic religion. And then in 1898, we were bought by America for 20 million. We went from Spanish colony to American colony. And that's the many of that amalgamation of that influence. But I think I, I wanted to end in this image because in my journey now, in as much as I, I'm in this trajectory writing this book, I think the most important thing for me is still truly to honor my pre-colonial roots, how spiritual it is for me as a trans woman, the sensuality of the journey, and to honor the long history of power, destruction, beauty, and spirit, and to carry that to know that my ancestors have survived and lived it. I just want to continue sharing, sharing that story and go back there, go to the roots. This thing, thank you. And in this moment, I think we all, I think it's really important to point out with all the anti-transgender legislation that we're seeing right now, where the most vulnerable the most vulnerable transgender youth that just wants to be who they are, that's being erased by governments, by systems, by legislation. I just want them to know, I, I work a lot with trans youth, but I just want them to know if there's one thing I could share is that I can't, obviously what we know now is like it's not gonna get really better right away but know that you are part of this long history of people that have always existed. And I believe, I truly believe this, that in as much as we're being, trying to be erased by governments, by systems, by media, by culture, I think that one of the main reasons is that the powers that be that wants to erase my people, my identity, particularly trans youth is that they know that trans people have the answer. This whole thing of rigidity of gender that's been in many conversations here, right? About feminism, equality, we've lived it. We know, and in this moment in our culture, the messages that we're receiving A culture and a system that doesn't want us to exist, but trans people still chooses every day to live our truth, to express who we are. I honestly don't know what's more powerful than that. So my final question to you is, <clears throat> A couple things. One, I was, I don't, I hadn't come across this term and it just might be my ignorance. But when you were talking about um, the, a sur the surgery, it was gender affirming surgery. And, and I was like, I haven't heard that terminology. I'm going to start using that terminology when it's about transition, this gender affirming surgery. Like, and, but what are other things that we can do for people that are in our lives? Um, that are trans, people that are gender fluid, if we have kids, if we have, you know, friends that have kids, if it, just in general, how can we be part of changing this, you know, decades and hundreds and years and millennia of, of erasing this incredible power? And we talked about what's threatening is the power of gender fluidity. It's not the you know, the, the differentness of it, but it's the power. So those two things, why are we afraid of that power and what can we do? Simple question, thank you. <laughs> I think I'd say is that really look in your heart. Those things that you've been questioning about what you've been led to believe, the limits of what you could express, who you could love, 
who you could be with the story that I've ever shared with you all is that find that in your heart, the freedom that I've shared, the freedom that trans people offer to the world, and hopefully what you truly see is the freedom to be who you are and truly reflect on that. But more so, if you have a trans person, gender non-conforming person, particularly a kid, be that vessel of light and be that support and that love. And I understand that we're still unpacking this, this systems and culture that we've been led to believe that gender is just this binary. Be there for that young trans kid. I've had so many people in my life that was there in the right moment that guided me into that direction. I don't know what I would have done without the support of my transgender mother, my macho dad. It was those people that led me to the next thing. And hopefully if you ever encounter, and anybody that's of difference, but particularly trans youth, honor them, support them, love them. Do not question and debate their existence because it is not a debate. That's what I'd say. Take out your phones and, 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 and make sure you grab that, right? Because many of you are gonna be moved to do something next and do something hyper-local. Um, we have two minutes left. What else do you wanna tell these beautiful people? I'll see you in the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I got cute for you guys. Look More at wearing applause. high heels. Let's go. Gina. <laughs> Thank is. you.